Tom Campbell here. If you find something of significant value in our videos, please consider supporting their production through our Patreon account or through a one-time donation. The links are in the description below. Thank you and enjoy the video. Good afternoon, Tom. We're going to do something a little different today. We have been collecting a few questions that we get sometimes in emails and uh, on posts. And I think your audience would like answers to them. They're very different. First question is, what evidence is available that was used for your assumptions that love, positive emotions, and positive interactions lower entropy locally and within the larger system? So what is your evidence that love well, is the answer? <laughs> yes. I've talked about that many times, and perhaps the, the, the person asking the question either missed it or uh, didn't make the uh, complete interpretation of it. So let me go over just a little bit again. And that is the first piece of evidence that we need and is a chain of evidence. You know, the logic is a chain. You know, if this is true, then that. If that's true, then, you know, something else. So it's a chain. The first step in the chain is that Consciousness is an information system. The second step is that information systems uh, evolve through lowering their entropy. Okay, that's the second thing. The third thing is that after the system uh, decided this just being one monolithic consciousness wasn't very profitable, it was too limiting, it made lots of individuated unit of consciousness, gave them all free will, and now let them interact with each other with that free will. That created a huge amount of possibilities that didn't exist before when it was one monolithic system. It also made consciousness a social system. Now, there were lots of beings with free will interacting with each other. That defines a social system. Okay. Now, in a social system, the concept or the approach that optimizes a social system is one of caring. It's one of cooperation. It's one of compassion. It's one of understanding. It's one of, of it being about other. That optimizes a social system. And then I went through this little uh, um, description of you have two groups of beings. You say you have you know, 100,000 in the love group and 100,000 in, in the fear group. And if you have the same sort of being, the same quality of being, the same types of being, so all that's equal. They're basically two equal bunches of being. You give each of these the same amount of resources. So you put them in, the, in an identical environment with identical resources, and they're more or less identical people as far as their quality and depth and you know intelligence and all those other stuff is basically the same. So now let's let those two groups evolve for a while and see where they go. So we can just look at the fear group versus the love group. And I break it into those two groups because that is really the, you know, those are the two opposites. Fear, um, is the opposite of love. Fear is about self. Love is about other. So that's the pair. It's not, um, you know, it's not love and hate. Hate's just a special case of fear. Um, so we have those two groups. Now, if the group, if the fear group, because they're full of fear, it's a fearful group. The people in it are all fearful. And if you're fearful, then it's very difficult to trust others because you're fearful that others will abuse you, take advantage of you, steal your stuff. So you're very untrust, untrusting about other people. So now most all the people in this group don't trust each other. Okay. And if you're fearful, fear is about you. It's, you can say that I'm fearful for other people, but your fear is yours. If that other person does this or does that, it will cause you to feel bad. It will cause you, you know, it, it's really about you. 
it's not them. Um, so fear is personal and self-focused. So in a self-focused group, like the fearful group is, if you have available resources, then the way self-centered people go about dividing up resources is they're grabby. They're greedy. What about me? I need to get what I need. I need to have all the resources that I'm going to have to need. I need all the shelter and the food and the this and the that that I'm going to have. And a little extra would be good too, just in case of hard times. And if there's not enough to go around, well, it's not my problem. I'm, my problem is to make sure enough will go around for me and the ones that are in my, my group. Okay, so that's the, that's the uh, approach that fear takes very self-centered. So what happens when you have that kind of a social system is that people start to group up in mutual defense packs because somebody who's bigger and stronger than you are will come along and take your stuff because they want stuff and you've got some and they'd like to have it. So they're big, you're small, they just take it away from you. And that's your problem, not their problem, because they're all about self not about other. And pretty soon then you go around and get a bunch of buddies who've had their stuff ripped off and now you, you bond together and say, well, we're all gonna, going to uh, protect each other. So now there's a group of you, you know, maybe 20 of you. Now these big guys can't take your stuff because you're 20 strong. Well, then other groups group up and they're 20 strong and now they'll, they're 50 strong and 100 strong, so you need more people. And so it goes until you end up Say at the end of 100 years, end of the century, you end up with 5% of the people owning 50% of all the resources, and you are very suboptimal as far as you as a social group, you as a society. Most of the people, the 95% the are basically the peasants, and the 5% are the, are the, the, the winners in this, in this uh, dog-eat-dog game. Okay, so that's what well, that's the fear group. Over on the on the side of love, it's about other. So there, if uh, uh, if you come up with a great idea, a new invention, or something that's going to be really helpful, immediately share it. Whereas in the fear group, you immediately, you know, uh, protect it from other people knowing about it. You know, you want rights to it. You want to be able to sell it. You want to be able to to use that. For, for your own self-betterment. So that would be the difference between the two groups. So the group that is about love and caring and cooperation, they want everybody in their group to have as much personal freedom to be how they are and do what they want to do. So everyone wants everybody else to have the life they want, to have the opportunities they want. That's a group that cares about other, not primarily about self. So in that group, you have a maximum amount of, of choice, a maximum amount of uh, things that you can do, things that you can be. You're not trapped into a career that's necessary because you need that career to give you the stuff that you need to get the resource, you know, give you the money you need to keep the resources you need to live the kind of life you want to live. Whereas in the love group, you can... Uh, be however, everybody, everybody will get enough. There's enough resources that everybody will get by. Some people will uh, contribute much, and some people will contribute little, and those that contribute much will probably get more, and those that contribute little will probably get less, but there'll always be enough, okay? Everybody has enough food, has shelter, you know, has, you know, has the basics, that they that they need to have and everybody is encouraged to grow to go back to school to educate themselves to learn and all those resources are available to help them do that so now if you look at those two group two groups a century later and see what you've got well you've got like i say uh you know a, a few upper class and a whole lot of lower and, and middle class and you have very unoptimized society that's, that uh, is very hierarchical, 
very top-down dominant, tends to have politics that represent a warlord mentality. You know, that's kind of a, you know, what you get there. Whereas on the other group, you have a group that is optimized for everyone according to the available resources. So that's the, the difference between the love group and the fear group. So now if we look at that and then we say, which one of those is lower entropy? Which one of those has the greatest organization, the greatest uh, um, connectedness? You know, it has the most potential. It's developed more of the potential of those 10, 100,000 people. You know, which one is it? And which one's developed the least amount of potential? And, and uh, you know, what's the standard of living in both places? You know, what is it like in both places? And which place would you rather live in? You know, if we kind of get those questions, then we can say that the group that's love-based, that's based on caring and cooperation, has, is the lower entropy group because they've optimized, they've structured themselves in such a way that everybody's a winner. Everybody can do pretty much what they want to when they want to, and everybody else will try to reorganize to make that happen within resources and, you know, within limitations. So that's how I get to the, the you know, that's the bridge that takes us from, from consciousness as the computer and, and consciousness is an information system. I guess I say that first, conscious information system. You know, consciousness evolves by lowering its entropy. Consciousness purpose, because it is a social system, is to move toward cooperation and caring and love. So that's the natural way it evolves. As it evolves the social system called consciousness, it evolves it toward love, toward caring toward optimizing for everybody because that's the low entropy solution. So that's why one, you know, I can associate the low entropy solution with love. Those are the same thing. The high entropy solution is fear. That's the high entropy. That's got uh, no optimization. It's a hard place to live. It's, it's, a, it's a, dog de a dog eat dog world. It's the uh, survival of the fittest sort of jungle mentality. Generally, politics are warlord type. Some, you know, very few people give orders and everybody else obeys. That's, that's what you get on that side. It's the grabby, what about me? How can I get more power, more control, and more force? So that's the basic ethic, control, power, force, as opposed to what can I give? How can I help? How can I make the system better for all of us, you see. So that's the connection. I think what the person is getting at, and he has indicated that he's familiar with your work, so the assumption, the um, assumptions he knows and the, um, and the logical thought process of s sustainability, really, mm -hmm. it is, is it for the, for the whole system? How will it sustain itself most profitably? Now, that's an efficient system. What he is mm -hmm. getting at is your particular evidence. Now, you do, you do consciousness exploration. You do, you do physics. Have you been able to actually go in and obtain evidence of this, of, of how this system needs to be lowering its em entropy, how it, need, how it needs to be efficient. What is the evidence that drew these conclusions for you? Well, the evidence is just everyday life. The, you know, I came to the conclusions logically. So it was the logic of the situation is how I came to that conclusion. That is the way logic works. You know, given the, where I started and where I ended up, then it's just logical that a social system has lower entropy and works better and is more optimized if people are caring and cooperative. You know, that's, 
uh, what do you call that, a, a tautology? You know, that's, that's obvious that that works right. If people are fussing and fighting and trying to control and force each other to do what they want them to do, then that's not going to be a very efficient, that's not going to be a very effective, it's not going to be a very good way of organizing the social system. You know, warlord mentality, you know, biggest person, you know, can grab as much as he can grab and then he's got he's to hold on to it. So he needs to be able to protect it. So everything is about, is about force, power, and control. So force, power, control is a very poor basis to run a social system. So that is so obvious that you don't really need, you know, any other evidence other than the logic that that's the way it works. But then if you just look at people, and all you have to do is look at people, find a bunch of people who are happy, who are cheerful, who smile all the time, and not just pretend. They're not smiling through gritted teeth. It's not a fake smile or a pretend smile, but they really are happy people, and they feel satisfied, life is good, and you will find that these people are people who care about other. Now you have a lot of people who pretend to be happy and satisfied because they got a couple of billion dollars in the bank and they you know, live in a big house with lots of servants and so on. But those people generally are not so happy. If you look at the, uh, um, the research that's been done on people who suddenly get wealthy, like win a, a lottery or something, we find out that suddenly having $50 million does not make somebody happy. And matter of fact, most of those people end up kind of crashing and burning, you know, afterwards. So the point is just, it's lo obviously logical and doesn't need any special evidence other than logic says this is the way it must be. But secondly, if you just look around and see how life works, look at your own life. And if you run your life out of control, power, and force, trying to manipulate things to be the way they want, I can tell you, you will be an unhappy person. You will be uh, a feel like an empty person. You will not find satisfaction. You will not find peace. You will be in a constant struggle because that's just the way that works. And if you run your life from a, from a more caring and more cooperative viewpoint, your life is no longer a constant struggle. So I've observed that in myself. I've observed that in other people. And you can observe that in various cultures and societies. Where the Your people, observations yeah, so over you can, 50 years yeah, so has you can shown just observe you. That. Yeah, you don't have to go to someplace non-physical to look around and see. You know, you can't do that because it's not clear just at looking as to what the entropy levels are. You have to live with people. You know, even, even w going to work every day with the same people, you don't really know those people. Most people at work just yeah. show you their image, show you what they want to show you. And if you really went home with them and lived with them for six months or a year or two, then you'd really know them. And you'd know them at a very deep level. And that would probably be very different than what you get when you just look at their, their image. So a lot of people smile and pretend that everything's okay because that's the politically correct way to be. But most people feel a lot more negativity than they do positiveness Well, in their this life. person asking the question claims that this is an extraordinary claim of yours, um, that it would require evidence to substantiate. He states you, Mm -hmm. uh, state unequivocally that positive emotions, lowering entropy in the larger system. Um, this is what this is what lowers entropy in a larger system. That is, this is huge. Maybe as important as everything else combined for our understanding of this subsystem. And I think he's right about that. He wanted more of evidential. Um, proof, evidential. He, exactly, and he should want evidential proof, and that's good. And I would, I would uh, encourage him to do his own experiments. Hmm. Don't just find out from somebody else. Don't ask for somebody else's opinion because, but like I say, not your experience, not your truth. 
Well, just try it. Work with it. Get rid of your fear. Become a person that really cares, not, not one who's pretending to care. You know, it's not like you're uh, acting caring or you're acting kind or you're acting cooperative, but rather you really are those things. Because acting is not what lowers your entropy. It's being those things is what lowers your entropy. So work on that. And I will guarantee this person that if they do that and they do get rid of those fears, they will see the difference. It will be their own experience that that leads to happiness. It leads to, you know, feeling good. It leads to a life of joy. That it's a completely different perspective on reality. And it's a very positive and good one. So if he just changes his attitude, changes his perspective to one of caring, but again, not pretending, not from the intellect. It, ha it can't be, I'm pretending this way. I'm acting this way. It has to be, I am this way. So it's a, a change in who you are. And if he does that, he will have his own evidence. He will have tons of evidence that will convince him. And he could do the other thing too. He could be, he could, uh, you know, serve his fears. And he could be, a, it's all about me. I'm the only one that's important. You know, it's what I can get and who I can use. And he can go through life that way, where everything is about him. And then after a six months or a year or two years of that, he can look around and say, well, where am I now? And how happy am I? And how much joy is in my life? And, you know, how are my relationships doing? And he'll find out that everything has gone to hell in a handbasket, that his relationships are horrible, nobody likes him. You know, he didn't get the promotion and everything starts to fall apart because that is a high entropy way to go. So he can try both paths and uh, spend some time with it. Now, most people are already fearful, so it's easy for them to work the fearful part. <laughs> most people actually live that way. They live the fearful part. But he will actually really have to change himself to live the cooperative part and the caring part. Well, but we that's offered, where the evidence should come from. It sure. should come from his own personal experience. Well, we offered some conjecture in one of the other interviews we did on the origins of consciousness, where it was, we, we gave a hypothetical situation since we are part of the larger consciousness system and our potential as an individuated unit of consciousness has the potential of love and fear in it, mm -hmm. then we, or you made the conjecture that perhaps the larger consciousness system itself had this potential of fear in the beginning and it evolved. Yeah, I know what you're talking about now. Sure. Okay. You know, you have to grow up. Consciousness just doesn't suddenly exist at a state of low entropy. That's what evolution is about. You start from wherever you start. And where you start is just with a lot of potential. You have potential for fear. You have potential for, for love. And now you start making choices based on your environment and what's going on, you know, what, what's in your awareness. And as you make those choices, you can evolve toward fear or toward love. You can evolve or de-evolve lower entropy or increase your entropy. And that the system, the larger conscious system had to grow up. It had to learn these things just like we're trying to learn them. So it's not like it just started out and was pure love and you know that's its nature. It's not like that at all. It started out with a lot of potential and it had to develop that potential and it could evolve or it could de-evolve. So, and it created a bunch of individuated units of consciousness with the idea that these individuated units of consciousness would make, would make good choices and therefore further their evolution. He uh, was a little disappointed about what those individuated units of consciousness decided to do because they had free will. And, you know, he had made this uh, wonderful uh, entropy reduction trainer for them to get into to speed up the evolutionary process and all sorts of, uh, of uh, consequences for their choices. Important, you know, the choices became very important. 
And of course, they didn't make choices about love and about caring and about cooperation. They made choices about me first. Survival choices, because that's the kind of environment they had. Just trying to survive was hard. And they wanted to survive, and they would take other people's stuff if that helped them to survive. So it was a generally a, a back to that uh, fear-based society, the dog-eat-dog, dog, uh, you know, uh, law of the jungle sort of a, an environment. And that's what came out of these new individual units of consciousness put in this environment. And the system tried to bully them. Stop doing that. Don't act like that. You need to behave. You need to you know, work with each other and so on. And of course, you can't force people or bully people into growing up. Growing up has to come from the inside out. So the, the larger kinds of system tried all sorts of ways, pressuring, bullying, punishing, being fearful, you know, scaring. It tried everything it could think of to make those IUOCs be better, but it all backfired. None of it worked. And what the larger consciousness found is that by pushing, bullying, using fear as a motivator, it just made things worse, not better. That All of those were counterproductive. And then it realized that the most productive thing it could do was just care for them, cooperate with yes. them, work with them, let them let them make their own choices and try to give them an environment in which you know they could they could make good choices now here's where some of your evidence comes in because we spoke with a professor in um, washington state who's a professor uh, of religious studies and and other disciplines as well but this conjecture on the larger consciousness system made a lot of sense to him in the sense of from his viewpoint of his studies, he said, finally, it made sense in terms of the Old Testament of the fearful, vengeful God and the New Testament message of love. It totally brought that together where he had never been yeah. able to put those two together before. So that is somewhat evidential, even though we are speculating, this is conjecture, there is some evidence there of that. Between well, it, makes, it makes sense. Mm. You know, that's the thing about a model. You know, a model isn't good. You don't judge a model to be a good model because it has great assumptions or a bad model because it doesn't or because of the results it comes to or anything else. You judge a model on how well can it explain things? How well does it explain the facts? The facts are the things that we know about, you know, and that's how you judge whether a model is a good model or not. So in that case, this model at least helped him see that difference between a, you know, an angry, jealous, you know, pushy, arrogant, um, egotistical God. Do it my way, damn it, or I'll turn you into pillars of salt, you know, that kind of a, of a, of a God versus the God of love that comes back then out of the, out of the New Testament. So I, you know, I came to my description independently. I didn't, I didn't make that up to fit his problem. I came to that idea because I knew that consciousness has to evolve. It can't just suddenly be full of love. You know, that's not the way it is. So the LCS had to learn that lesson just like we have to learn it. And we were the, I don't know what to call it, like the foil, we, we were the entities that taught it that lesson. So it learned by having to deal with these IUOCs it had created. So it, yeah, it came to, to that conclusion. So now here we are, we have to interact with each other and teach each other how mm -hmm. to grow up, okay? The, the LCS grew up because it realized, and it was pretty fast, I think, on the uptake. It, it eventually said, oh, you know, this isn't working. Everything I'm trying to do makes it worse. And it eventually realized that love is the answer, not control, power, and force is not the answer. Yeah, we'll make it clear that this, this was what came to the professor because yeah. of the studies that, that he yeah. was involved in. 
this made this made sense to him, yeah. but it also makes sense in a logical um, social system sense as as you present it. Um, yeah, so I'll go a, on. Uh, okay, that, go that ahead. So you know, peoples all over in different cultures and different religions uh, tended to have angry gods or gods that would get angry with them. That's pretty typical. God was an angry, vengeful sort of god. If you look at indigenous cultures that you know go back many thousands of years, as opposed to like Western culture that only goes back you know a few hundred years. If you get cultures that go way back, you see that's pretty you know pretty typical. And of course, the Old Testament was basically uh, you know out of the Jewish tradition, and that was where that comes from but you don't have to just stick with that if you go to all sorts of other traditions outside the jewish tradition you'll find similar kinds of similar kinds of uh, attitudes that's right and then the message of of love and uh so many um things that correspond with what you're saying that love is the answer that was the mm -hmm. message of the New Testament. He, this person goes on to say, and the second part of the question here, yeah. aggression, fear, anger, and tribal identity have increased fitness and ensured survival according to social scientists. How does that fit into this model? And you've answered some of that. Yeah. It seems it's too necessary for the evolution of the whole in some way, all of these things. Well, and Okay, let me do that part first. Well, the social scientists are just wrong. They have a small picture. What, they, what they're looking at was the way we evolved here. And yes, we evolved through a lot of struggle and a lot of warring and a you know, warlord mentality and so on. That's how we evolved. Okay. And it's taken us a long time. We've had that warlord mentality, you know, for out of the 200,000 years that uh, Homo sapiens been walking around on the planet, uh, probably 195,000 of them, almost all of it, has been warring and fighting and, you know, self-centered warlord politics. And that's the way it's been. So it's been that way a very long time. But that doesn't mean that you should jump to the conclusion that it has to be that way or that was a good thing. That was the positive thing. It's just the way it was, you know, and we adapted as best we could within that kind of a social arrangement, the control power for social arrangement. We did what we could. And yes, maybe we had to try harder and run faster in that kind of a thing. But I wouldn't say that that was, you know, that it was necessary. It's just the way it was. And I certainly wouldn't say that it was a good thing. We needed that. We didn't need that. It would have been nice if we could have gone straight to cooperation and caring and, you know, optimize the society. We'd be so much further ahead right now. So it, it's not that that was a good thing. It just was what we did. It was the choices we make. We humans have a very low quality of consciousness in general. We're not uh, graduate school. We're in kindergarten in this, you know, learning lab. And that's where we are. So the fear is never a positive thing. You know, people confuse that. People think that, uh, you know, fear is positive. If you, if you use fear as a way to manipulate people, you can manipulate people people to a positive end using fear. Like you make your, uh, your children very afraid of uh, sexuality so that you will keep them from being sexual until they're older. You know, you don't want them to engage in, in uh, sexual behavior too young. So you try to frighten them and tell them how horrible it is and, and give them a lot of fear about it. And that doesn't help. It's not that that's a good thing. That's a bad thing. What they need is, is accurate information. They need guidance. They need support. They need um, you know, older people that they can really talk to, not be older people they're afraid to talk to, that they can't talk to. So fear isn't something that, that is better. 
It doesn't mean that, you know, we don't have a lot of things that are, that are fearful, you know, like our, our legal system is based on fear. Don't do these things or you will get caught and put in jail. And if you make people afraid enough of being caught and put in jail, then they will tend to act better. So that's a fear-based system. But that system, though it may keep the bad behavior at bay somewhat, it may have some effectiveness, but it's really a terrible system. Much better is you don't do these things, not because you're afraid of getting caught, but because you know those are not nice things to do. You don't do those things because they're not moral, they're not ethical. And that's why you don't do them. That's a much more powerful system. That's a so much better system. So the fact that we say, well, a lot of our culture, you know, only works because of fear. Well, we live in a very low quality of consciousness and fear is what we, what we use. But that doesn't mean it's necessary or optimal. It's very suboptimal. Whenever you use fear to manipulate people, you end up with a much you know, poorer conclusion than you would if you were not manipulating people at all, just giving them information. Was it simply a matter of uh, that was a way to survive? That was how we were evolving. That was the quality of consciousness at the time until it evolved into a more yeah. uh, civilized way. Um, it's not that these things... Um, seem necessary for evolution although in a way if uh, you were not aggressive you you didn't survive yeah well that's what it did that's why it's taken us 200,000 <laughs> years pretty much all of that that's why we have evolved so slowly because when you constantly are making wrong choices you don't grow up very quickly so yes we've had all that fear and the, if you were the big tough guy and you were belligerent and you you know had the bigger club then you got the lead you got advantages you know so sure we had a culture that if you were what strong arrogant forceful domineering um if you were fascist in your attitude by that I just mean control, power, force is, is, is the ethic, then you're going to set the uh, you know, genetics that that is what's going to survive and reproduce. Well, and you can say, that's a good thing. Well, it wasn't a good thing. It's taken us, you know, out of the 200,000 years, it's taken us, you know, you know uh, what, almost all of that, and we're still just beginning to crawl out of the control power force ethic. And I'd say that that ethic still dominates people, dominates our culture. It still does. You know, that's not because that's such a wonderful way to go. It's just the way we chose. But it's a horrible way to go. We could have evolved so much sooner. So what that's done is, yes, we, so we genetically select, we're, you know, large, belligerent, violent people. And that's been the way it is. People who are arrogant, people who are greedy, and our culture tends to drive people to be self-centered and self-focused, big egos. Oh, you need a big ego because otherwise people will walk all over you. You'll be a doormat. Stand up for yourself. Fight back. Push back. Somebody says something you don't like. Push back. Slap them. You know, be tough. They'll stop messing with you. Well, that's the control power force game. And yes, that's the game we've played. And that's what our selection has been. And the result of that is almost 200,000 years of belligerence, you know, dysfunction, and talk about efficiency and, uh, and close to zero efficiency in our social system. And yes, we've been able to, to grow and do a few things, but you know, most of that growth has taken place in the last 300 years, three or 400 years. If you go back, well, let's say 500 years, it's a nice round number. You go back 500 years from that time, 500 years ago, all the way up to the beginning of Homo sapiens, nothing much changed. It was about the same. We didn't really start to make significant changes only the last few centuries. So, yeah, that's where it got us. Pretty close to the zero evolution, 
level. And now we have to overcome that stuff. Yes, we're selected for arrogance and we're selected for being pushy. And we have to deal with that. We have to outgrow it. You see? So what it did is created a hole that now we have to climb out of. I don't call that, you know, really a big bonus that, uh, oh, we needed that. That's what made us strong. No, that's what made us dysfunctional is what it made us. You take this, the sociologist's little view of the way things were and think that, well, that that's, was really good. It was necessary because look where we are now. So we needed all that rough stuff to be the people we are now. No, <laughs> we're the people we are now who are still in kindergarten trying to grow up because of all that stuff. It's not that that was so helpful. It's that just that was the way it was. That was the level at which we've been operating. So that's, well, that's, that's the problem there with, his, with that viewpoint. Okay. Um, he goes on with the question, possibly your assumptions are based on the relationship between coherence and entropy? If so, how did you obtain the evidence for an assumption that positive emotions like love, empathy, compassion have high coherence? Well, again, I just say that's self-evident. That's logical. If you, if you take um, the opposite things, you know, you take fear, self-centeredness, arrogance, violence, control, power, force, it's clear that those are dysfunctional. Those don't build. Those don't, you know, evolve into better and better and better things. They just keep on, you know, people have been beating each other with clubs for 200,000 years. Well, the clubs just got better and, and niftier. And, you know, the clubs turned into spears and spears turned into guns and or bows and arrows and they turned into guns. And, I mean, we found better, <clears throat> more efficient ways to kill each other, but we haven't grown up much is the thing so <clears throat> it's just kind of self-evident that that doesn't work <laughs> that's totally dysfunctional we can see 200,000 years of evolution and going nowhere at all still very dysfunctional still a lot of war still a lot of corruption still a lot of uh, of people bullying and, and taking advantage of other people uh, still a lot of lying, cheating, and stealing going on, you know, that's legal and protected. Um, so, sure, well, that's what you've we've been tapped doing. In, you've tapped into the history databases, as you call them. <clears throat> Sometimes they're called Akashic Records. In your science terminology, you call them databases. These databases are ac accessible because they're, they're past history databases, um, past and uh, present and future databases, I guess. So have you ever explored a little of this concept within some of the past databases to see what was transpiring and seeing how that, how that did not work well? Well, sure. And you don't need to go into databases to do that. All you have to do is pick up a history book. You know, all of us probably had world history when we were in college or even in high school, you know, and you'll find out that world history is mostly defined by war. You know, who conquered who? Who overran who? It's all about war. That's the, that's the driving element in, in our history. Control, power force, greed, and those things are dysfunctional. In a social system, that stuff is just dysfunctional, and it's always been dysfunctional. So look at the evidence and say, well, where have we been? Oh, you've been these hardy, healthy people who have to constantly run and hide to not be slaughtered by whoever has the bigger guns, and that's made us more fit. <laughs> well, that's kind of a silly thing, you know? Yes, it's made us more fit but it's given us a totally dysfunctional world to live in. You know, there's other ways to become fit, you know, that you don't need, you know, to fight each other, try to dominate each other in order to be fit. 
that's kind of ridiculous, you know, to say, well, that was good for us. Look, we're healthy and fit because we had all this stuff. <laughs> that's, uh, I don't know, that's, that's just silly, you know. It, uh, it's the can, choices is what it yeah. boils down to, yeah. right? Yeah, so sure, just any history will tell you that control power force has been the motivating factor in most of world history. Best we can tell, it's been that way from the beginning. From and the also, beginning. just logically, uh, consciousness has to evolve and it has to go through all of the bad parts to get to finally uh, pretty, understand what works more pretty, efficiently. Pretty much, yeah, you just can't jump to the answer. Mm, consciousness yeah. starts and it's it's neutral it has a lot of potential it has potential to evolve positively and a potential to evolve negatively it has free will and now that free will has to start making choices and then begin growing up well that free will when it got into this when it was in the chat room before there was this nice uh, entropy reduction trainer for it to work in it was in the chat room and the choices just weren't you know, very meaningful. The choices didn't have a lot of consequences. There wasn't a lot of growth potential in it. So the system decided to evolve a, a trainer that had much more, um, uh, you know, life and death, much more right mm -hmm. and wrong, much more good and bad kind of choices. in instant it. Instant feedback within yeah, a physical. Instant feedback, absolutely. Yeah. So once it did that, then the trainer's the fast track for evolution. So then these entities that were mostly neutral, you know, hadn't evolved too much one way or the other, but had the potential to evolve both ways. The potential's there. And they, in this trainer, where there were so many high, you know, high, re you know, what is it? Um, where the consequences were, were really drastic and dramatic. Well, basically their first choices we're to the side of control, power, and force. And that's where we started. So that's where you have to start. That's where they were driven. And now we have to work ourselves out of that hole and become kinder, gentler, more caring, more cooperative, and work together. When we experience the fear and aggression and tribal modes such as that, there was more. Fear potential, would you say? No, I think there's always, you know, the, the potential of us is, mm. is just there. That's, that's what can we, what can we in this social system of consciousness, what can we form? What, how can we organize ourselves? How can we interact in such a way that it lowers entropy? That's our, that's our point. So we needed to interact with each other and the way we started was in a big chat room, which didn't do much to, you know, to develop our potential. The potential just still sat there. So yes, we have the same potential to become love as the larger conscious system, and the same potential to de-evolve down to, down to you know, terrible fear. And so did the larger conscious system. You know, we have the potential to go either way, and we evolve according to the choices we make. As we make choices, that helps us evolve. So that's what we've been doing. And it well, it's struggled out. as much as we have to struggle. Sure. Um, but one, so, of the, you know, one of the things, Donna, that explains why it is we started out de-evolving or why we started out you know, where we did is that there is always many more ways to do something wrong. To, there's many more ways to raise entropy than they are to lower entropy. So if you get to a, a, a choice of some sort, you'll always find that there's maybe two or three good solutions that will lower entropy, high quality choices. But there's thousands of ways to do it badly. Just a few ways to do it well, but thousands of ways to do it badly. You see, so when, so, so the, the probability of you just starting from a, some un, what do we say, un, you know, unevolved potential, could go either way, it's just kind of neutral. Well, and it starts making choices. It's more likely most of those choices are gonna be bad choices because it doesn't have any experience yet. It's just making choices. 
because it's so much easier to tear something down than it is to build something up. You know, it takes a long time to build a hundred story high rise building, but it only takes about 10 minutes to destroy that. So it's so much easier to destroy. It's so much easier to do uh, control power force than it is to do cooperation, caring, you know, and love. So yeah. that's why we acted so badly in the beginning yeah. is because that's just the easier way. That's kind of the, what you expect. It's the, it's, you know, particularly when you get thrown into life and death, you know, uh, situations with the first, I don't know what first tons of thousands of homo sapiens that were on the earth is a pretty big struggle just to get through the day, just to live on to the next day. And for a long time, it wasn't all that certain whether homo sapiens would go extinct or not. You know, so it was a tough game. And it's so much easier to make bad choices than it is to make good choices. So the fact that we started out at the bottom, making poor choices, and that it took us a while to realize that we could get a whole lot more, a whole lot better, a whole lot easier if we made good choices, cooperative and caring choices, that just takes a long time to figure that out. Okay. So that was know, my point. Yeah. yeah thank it's you. Just, it's just the way it is. You know, it's going to take a long time to learn those things. Yes, it took the larger council system, uh, you know, enough time to learn those things. Um, you know, but we're a little slower. We don't have the big picture. We don't have as big a picture as the larger consciousness system. So we're going to be a little slower at it. We're a little more self-centered and a, a little more isolated than the system in our own mind. So we're not going to do it so quickly. But we're working on it, and we will do it, and we're gaining on it. And you can see the progress getting more and more every year. So, yeah, we're coming along, and now we have the opportunity in the next couple of decades to take some big steps, not just these tiny little steps that we've been taking for the most of that 200,000 years, and now we're taking little bigger steps since about 500 years ago, and then in the last, say, century, we've taken, you know, much bigger steps, but all of it seems kind of small, you know, when you have it from the big picture, so... But we have an opportunity to take some some giant leaps forward now that uh, we we may especially, or may not. Especially with your concept of virtual reality. Yeah, coming along, right? That will coming that's along. liable to be the thing that kicks it off. Yeah. So we have the potential. Whether we'll grab that potential and actualize it, eh, that's yet to be seen. But we've never before even had that opportunity as a species. But we do we do now we've been so scattered and so divided as a species but now we have um, kind of instant communications all over the world ways to see and watch and hear and communicate with each other and things that happen one place that are significant show up all over the place you know within days now so it's not uh, like it was before we can change and change interesting. quickly interesting yeah. times too um with a lot of potential. I'll go on with the next question. Uh, this is regarding the relationship between PMRs. Now, in your, your, that is one of your acronyms for physical matter reality. If one PMR sinks into high entropy or rises to low entropy, is there any impact on other PMRs? These are, these are realities within your concept of a virtual reality to mm -hmm. explain a little are we really all in this together or just all within our own pmrs it's pretty much just all within our own pmrs if you look at it from the viewpoint of us from the viewpoint of the individual units of consciousness that are using our pmr our virtual reality trainer that we call our physical universe if from our viewpoint it's pretty much about us. If you take the viewpoint of the system, then we're all in it together. You know, from that viewpoint, then the whole system evolves and the whole system contains all these other PMRs. So the whole system is a system and it all is going to have to grow together. But within a single PMR, the, the entities there, the consciousness playing in that game only interact with other players in that game. 
So the interaction is, is, is local to a particular PMR. Now, there are some crosstalks. There are people who go from this PMR and go, you know, incarnate in some other PMR, but that's in the margins. So it's not the main thing. So typically, um, it's, a, it's a closed set within a PMR, within this universe. And we chug along, interacting with each other, and mostly the people who, who come to this particular virtual reality return to it because they know the ropes, they know how it works, and actually this is a pretty good virtual reality to be in, from my opinion of seeing others. This is a, this is a good one, as, as, as strange as that may sound. As dysfunctional as we are, it, uh, there's a lot of opportunity here for growth. So anyway, um, yes, it is a, it, it's, it's like Petri dishes. You know, if, if you live in a Petri dish, then it's pretty local to that Petri dish because the hospital or the, or the lab takes a lot of precautions that the Petri dishes don't interact with each other because they've got different things growing in each Petri dish. So then if you're inside that Petri dish, yeah, it's just about the entities that are in this virtual reality Petri dish. But there are, if you're the laboratory now, from the laboratory's view, it's about all the petri dishes. It's about all the experiments you have going on. It's about all the, all those possibilities and how they're working out. So it just depends on your, your perspective. From system view, we're all in it together. From a local view here of this virtual reality, it's just us. All right, Tom. Um, the next question, do IUOCs track or watch experiences across PMRs for insight into how to help lower entropy for the LCS? I guess he might be talking about, now when, he's, when you say IUOC, you mean an individuated unit of consciousness. That's the sum total of all of the experiences you have yeah. being. Are yeah. there beings that, that do this sort of thing? Yeah, somewhat. You know, I don't, I don't really know how to answer that question. Most, that question is kind of above my visibility in the sense that there are, like I, I, in my book, I, I come with the tongue in cheek term, the big cheese, just to keep people from getting too serious about that, you know, so they don't get wrapped up around a, a God figure. So call him the big cheese and all right, he's, he is kind of the boss of this what I call end of vision, of which part our virtual reality is a part of that. Okay. Now there are other groups. So there's other groups, and they have no doubt big Jesus of their own that are kind of responsible for managing and seeing that the rules are obeyed and so on in those areas. And I suspect that there may be another layer up above that tries to coordinate and you know learn lessons from both and all around, but probably it's just the system. I don't, I don't see anything compelling that makes me put another hierarchy above that, you know, one that assesses all the PMRs from all the systems and tries to come up with a, with a, uh, a larger strategy based on lessons learned. That's the system's job. So I suspect that's what the larger conscious system does. Think of the larger consciousness system as something that can configure itself into a lot of individuated unit of consciousness. It can configure itself into a computer that's a server for our virtual reality. It can configure itself for other virtual realities and, and so on. So it can, it can configure itself in lots of ways, but it still maintains a kind of a control function like the operating system. You know, if you have a lot of things going on in computers, you need an operating system to keep track of all of them and to coordinate them. And I, that's the larger system's role, to do that. So yes, I think that's done. But whether that's done by what you'd call an IUOC or not, eh, now we're quibbling over details. If you want to, you could even say that the larger conscious system is an IUOC. It's individuated. It's a unit of consciousness. So it's the larger consciousness system, which contains a lot of other IUOCs, 
But if you want to think of it itself, the LCS is an IUOC that contains other IUOCs within it. You say, well, we could do that. So then everything's an IUOC, including the larger consciousness system. But if you don't like that metaphor, if you'd rather have the larger consciousness system is the operating system, and then it created all these IUOCs that are out, you know, experiencing, then that's another metaphor. And it really doesn't make a lot of difference. You know, whether you pick one of those metaphors or the other is not all that significant. That's just playing with the metaphors. I try to keep my metaphors as simple as possible without a lot of complication. But, you know, that would be a change that, that's not really a change. It's just a way of naming things. And it's hard to put these kinds yeah, of concepts into language. Yeah, it doesn't so. matter. Either way works. You know, that's irrelevant. It's not, it's not something that actually makes any difference. Okay. Uh, the next question and the last question, is there a one-to-one -one or one-to-many relationship between a PMR and the IUOC that facilitates it? As in, does each PMR require a single IUOC to facilitate the experience, or can one generate multiple PMRs? I think you somewhat answered that with, uh, there's an IUOC that facilitates other PMRs, if that's what mm -hmm. it is referring to. Um, or can one generate multiple PMRs? I'm not sure about that. Yeah. I think we talked about that the last time when we pulled up that figure five out of uh, book uh, three, mm. talked about it. Yes, you can have, you know, the big cheese who is, a, is an IUOC in charge of end division and end division may have multiple PMRs just within end division, yeah. may have. Now, all of this is just not saying that, that uh, that's exactly the way it is, but that's sort of speculation from as much of it as I could see. You know, I'm, I'm limited into how big a picture that I got from my own information and how I interpret that picture. So I'm putting together a, a model that's based on my own information that I got from my own exploring, which has been probably more thorough than most because I've been doing it for a very long time. And um, so I don't know, you know, from what he's saying that yes, you can have one that is in charge of multiple, multiple uh, PMRs. That may happen, but if it turned out that that was too much to track or too much to do, they could break that apart and do something else. I mean, it's all very organic. It's not like this, this organization is in concrete. This organization is just metaphors. You know, the LCS is a metaphor for source. The IUOCs are a metaphor for pieces of consciousness, us. You know, so they're all metaphors. And now seeing about how these metaphors might be divided up and what they might do and, you know, what they do on vacation and who takes care of what, that's pushing all of it probably past the point of, of making any sense. These are just general ideas based on my limited, you know, understanding from the information that I got and my interpretation of it. And I wouldn't put a lot of, you know, I wouldn't put a lot of what, uh, credibility or credence in any of it you know it's just a model and it doesn't really matter about the organizational structure that the lcs has generated to manage all of the things that it's doing you know that that management structure is really not important to anybody's growth it's kind of above our pay grade to you know to say anything too certain about that it's not, okay. yeah, it's just not a meaningful thing. What's meaningful are the things that will help you evolve and, or de-evolve. That's meaningful. And this kind of speculation is not all that significant. Okay. I know that the key part to your model, your My Big Toe model, is that it is from, the my is from your own experience. Right. And that you encourage others to explore, to find out on their own. Um, some of these things. It's open to all consciousness. It's um, yeah. uh, 
Well, yeah. I, tried, I tried to restrict my model to just the necessary components that the consciousness required. You know, I had these facts of consciousness, and my model tries to explain all of those facts. And if there's something, you know, like um, higher selves, you know, people, two people talk about their higher self their, and so on. I don't really go into any of that because it's not required. You know, what does the what does the IUC do all day while the free will awareness unit is off making choices? You know, well, it's not necessary to go into that. That's not an essential part of the picture. So there may be other things there, but they're not necessarily, you know, they're not logical necessities. You can add things, you can you can have conjecture, you can add all kinds of things, but all that's conjecture. I just have in my model the things that were logically necessary to answer, you know, to, to represent my experience and the nature of the fundamental nature of consciousness. So I don't go into a lot of description about those kinds of things because they're more or less pointless. They're not they're not significant, they're not fundamental. They're not fundamental to you to um, the goal of uh, lowering entropy, becoming right. love. So those the things that you need to know are the yeah. choices that you make. You make your best choices. You do have free will. Yeah. And so how how the larger conscious system runs its business, you know, and mm-hmm. and how how does it organize everything, and how does it how does it optimize learning from all the various things it's got going? That just that's no point in going there. You know, it it does whatever it does, and it changes whenever it needs to change. If it finds that some arrangement is not working well, then it changes it to work better. It's evolving. It's not a fixed system that you can make an organizational chart and say, you know, here's how it runs. All of those are just notional. You know, they're just metaphors. They're not necessarily the way it is. The system will constantly evolve into doing things however it thinks it gets the most return for its investment. Well, it's a living, viable system. Right. I mean, you are comparing it to computer, but and data when we talk about databases. But this is this it's is a conscious ongoing, computer. Yeah, it's a conscious computer. You know, it's a being. Mm. So you have to think of it as a as a you know what a living thing, a being, a thing that makes choices. A thing that does evaluation and assessments, something that understands logic and analysis, and it can change how it does things. So a highly not... evolved, aware intelligence, would you sure. say that was right? All right. Sure. Well, thank you, Tom. Yeah. This has been very interesting, and I'm glad we saved those questions and were able to do this in this, in this uh, short interview. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Donna. Tom Campbell here. INMBT Events, hope you liked this video. We now have well over a thousand hours of free video on this user-friendly, ad-free YouTube channel. Though these videos are free to our viewers, they represent many thousands of hours in production and editing, and many thousands of dollars invested in video and audio equipment, along with the required computers and software to store and process the raw video into finished products. So far, all of this content has been funded directly out of our own pockets. Be assured, we will always continue to do what we can. It's our life, our purpose, a labor of love that we will continue to pursue as best we can. However, those pockets are not as deep as they used to be. Thus, we are now seeking to augment our resources with support from our viewers. If you find something of significant value in our videos, please consider supporting their production through our Patreon account or through a one-time donation. The links are in the description below. Thank you.